Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast with the science and the screaming to determine what is the single greatest movie of any given year. My name is Host, and I'll be your Kate tonight. With me today are our lovely Your Pop Filter standards, Mr. Mike. I'm Mr. Mike. Yeah, it's just Mike. Mike. (laughs) Uh, And you're Mr. Ryan. I'll be your Mr. Ryan tonight. Please, Mr. Ryan was his father. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with us today are two special guests. Uh, Nate, you want to say hi? Hey, it's me. It's Nate. I've been on here before. Good to see you. Yes, you have. Good to see you, too. How about you? And and, and hello, Van. Hello. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, I'm going to be on the show a little bit more often here, I believe. That rolls. Yeah, it's cool. Movies rock and talking about them with friends. <laughs> yeah, man. Okie dokie. So before we get into anything... I'm ready to hear your guys' kind of overall opinions. Um, Nate, let's start with you. What, what do you feel about this movie? Oh, man. Is, is there is there a more B of a B movie or even more C of a B movie <laughs> to the point where it's like, hey, this has everything you're looking for. It's got the horrible special effects. It's got the no budget. It's got Bobo David Schwimmer. It's got <laughs> uh, cheap sets and voiceover galore to do all the pipe laying before you start the movie like hey this movie could have been made anywhere between 1959 and 1985 and somehow it happens to be in the year 1975 nate this is not the kind of movie you want to bring the phrase pipe laying into the vernacular (laughs) i also i also clocked that phrase pretty it definitely resonated (laughs) um what about you mike Since you offered your voice. I will always offer up my voice in tribute (laughs) to our gods, the listeners. I love schlock. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I love people eating people. Call me crazy, Mm -hmm. but it's just a good old time of the movies. And this movie sure did happen. (laughs) We sure watched this movie that I watched forever ago. So excited was I for the 1975 that I was like, I'm going to watch the most Mike out of all these movies. I'm going to watch Shivers. And, uh... Sorry? Really? <laughs> Don't feel the need to expand. I won't. <laughs> I just apologize. I <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you, Van? So I'm just glad I don't have that, you know, it's, I think it's called a metaphobia where you're, you've got that irrational fear of vomiting because right off the bat, yeah. that was disgusting. Uh, but I enjoyed it, you know, yeah. suffice <laughs> it to say. Yeah. Yeah. You love vomiting. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah vomit even delicious. There. Yes, the yeah. cannibalistic, you know, aspects of that. Totally <laughs> yeah. agree. Very intriguing. They got to the first kill right off the bat, which I feel like in any horror movie, you cannot wait too long before you have your um, first yeah. kill. So, yeah, I, you know what? I thought it was a good, bad movie. Excellent answer. Not that I have opinions yet. Ryan, <laughs> do you have an opinion yet? I agree. I'm... I'm excited to talk to you guys so I can hash some of my thoughts out because th- mm-hmm. uh, I'm, they're a little confusing to me right now. Um, I've never seen sex in a movie before, so this is my first time. And what uh, I've never seen sex. This was a this was revelatory. You were probably learning so much from this. Movie. <laughs> I was learning a lot. <laughs> now I know what the marital bre- bed will promise me. <laughs> slugs. Well, you're uh, my slugs. Wife. <laughs> yeah, you're my wife. Let me give you slugs. Uh, um. I thought he was great. Uh, you said David Schwimmer, Nate. I was thinking um, Adam Driver halfway to becoming a werewolf. Like he stopped halfway in the transition. Nice. Uh, he was Adam Driver being halfway to becoming a horse. That's uh, what that guy was. That's, Adam Driver, that's the Kate. end of that conversation. <laughs> but no, I thought it was. I thought it was really good. Or I mean, I thought it was good for what it was. I thought that I was. I was always excited. I don't know if that's the best word to see what happened next. You know, I did want to see where it was going to be taken, um, which did drag me through some of the slower parts. And mm-hmm. slower parts were a choice, but slower parts are necessary with this budget. You know, and that's part of what I want to get into tonight too. Is what. What do we think were decisions that he made and what were decisions that were sort of forced upon him because yeah. I ain't got no money? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a big part of that, a big part of what I'm hoping to like get out of our conversation tonight is figuring out the parameters or like the, the, it, it's hard to even, it's hard to understand this film in terms of like, is it good? Is it bad? Would you have to have some frame of reference? And I think establishing like, 
you know, who Cronenberg is, body horror, uh, you know, 1975, all these factories and trying to parse through those to actually figure out, is this enjoyable? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know if I, I, I kind of liked watching it. I kind of was bored. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to delving in with all of you fine people. Uh, when we're back, our first taste bud. Despite being his third feature, David Cronenberg's Shivers is widely regarded as his first movie, or at least his big break. It also almost ruined his career. The movie broke Canadian box office records and at the time was the most profitable movie in Canada's obviously stupid film history, but it definitely (laughs) had its detractors. Many Canadian journalists called it the worst movie of all time, and a campaign to ban the film was started. Headlines read, you should know how bad this film is. After all, you paid for it. As the movie was in part funded by a grant from the Canadian government, this made it nearly impossible for Cronenberg to get funding, and it took years for him to make his next movie. The film tells a story of a slug-looking parasite that runs amok in a high-rise apartment complex. Once you're infected, you become a rapey zombie that will stop at nothing to pass the infection to others. Or you can just cough out the slug, and it will run around and jump into other people. We don't know how it really works, but it is gross. Taste buds, I ask you this. Where in this movie can we see the promise of Cronenberg's future mastery of the body horror genre? Um, let's start with Ryan. I know that you have a particular fondness for Cronenberg, right? I, or you don't, but you have some. Explain your relationship to the man, I beg. Uh, yeah, I think that he has some good movies and some bad movies. And then some right in the middle. But I think that the thing that he's most famous for is... He d- I think that he's creeped out by human bodies, honestly. And I think what he does, in a way, is makes it so you are too. Like, it's not fair that only I'm disgusted. I want you to be too. And so he just plays with them. And to me, it's not just the, like the, the chopping up of a woman and putting acid in her body. That's in every horror movie. We can get sure. that from anybody. Um, but the popping out of the body the you know uh, the bulging stomachs um that i think he's like is it this gross and we're like yes dude we thought so before and we think so now <laughs> <laughs> we all knew we've all known <laughs> um what about what about you van how did you feel I think you can see it in how he sets up the body horror absolutely so if you just look at he, he is i think one of the first creators to like try and fully show the transformation of like the person into whatever you know horrible creature they're becoming because usually you know the special effects are going to be so bad that you've got to cut away you you know you can't exactly show everything that's going down but you know when uh, our main character there or what was it nicholas i think he's lying on his bed and his stomach is moving and it's pulsating and you can just see that and he stays on that that's one thing i've definitely noted with cronenberg is that he the camera is not going to go anywhere. He will stay on the subject for as long as he wants to. And he, he lets, you know, the camera take its time before going to the new shot. It kind of makes yeah. other directors that come around later, like maybe the early 80s, feel a little bit like cheaters because mm-hmm. with MTV, they move the camera as much as possible, mm-hmm. you know? And it's, it's it, just to get out of stuff like that. And he's like, no, mm-hmm. you sit here and you watch this. You watch well, what yeah. I've done. It's uncomfortable. I think that's the... It is uncomfortable. And I think that the it's part and parcel with what he's doing and that he is a voyeur. He's like an exploitative voyeur watching something that disgusting, watching a body be freaky and, and, and mutilated and all that stuff. Like the gaze is as important as the practical effects. Yeah. It's not even Um, just the gross outs. It's, it's, mm -hmm. we start with what I assumed in the opening of this film was an underaged girl being, assaulted sexually and then yeah. it's like oh no she's supposed to be i guess 25 or something but it's still very uncomfortable 19, because it's a but okay. he also started at 12 with yeah it was, it was at least they like you like, know like, you thought she was underage she's not don't worry but she, she but was, she was. When started <laughs> by a lot yeah so so the first woman we see killed is definitely underage and dressed like a catholic schoolgirl in a very like hey this is what men want so you're gonna be titillated you assholes get ready to go and then yeah. we have you all always, sorts I'm, of creepy stuff that is not even just the body horror but like we want you to be afraid of everything the one guy Mm -hmm. says titty cancer at one point which is the grossest way of bringing up breast cancer it is the medical term thought of (laughs) it's a doctor right 
<laughs> yeah. Well, and this is the thing, right? Like the my disappointment maybe with the movie is Cronenberg should have just made the movie about the the rep, the living replacement organs that uh, that, right. that was the the MacGuffin that everybody that, believed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie is called Never Let Me Go, and it has some body horror, but not nearly like this. But if you want replacement <laughs> clone organs, go to that film. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how, how do you how do you feel, Mike, about about Cronenberg? I, I I do like the angle, and it makes a lot of sense to me that he is disgusted by this. That there, I think there are other schlock directors who they're titillated by what they're showing on screen, but it does look like he is trying to hold back vomit the whole time. Like he's not looking away because he can't, and that the hacks that come later, and by hacks I mean directors I love, like James Gunn Slither is just a modern this. Like it's mm-hmm. there, there are mm-hmm. also. Uh, creepy little slugs that start making people zombify. But when he looks like, look how gross this is, it's because it's like fully prosthetics and, and Michael Rooker's turning into another thing where Cronenberg is like, no, 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 no. The human body itself is filthy and nasty. Let's look at that and appreciate that. (laughs) And that like a a lot of good horror, uh, the monsters are people who haven't even turned yet. Like the the guy who's talking about the replacement organs is telling the, the journalist, the detective cat, what's going on and he's like well the the girl who started all you know she started sleeping with the guy at, at, at 12 as you do like i thought started this was gonna be her sleeping with the guy one of her 12. one of her co-heroes uh this doctor who's explaining everything is also a disgusting pedophilic rapist so that's the kind well, of world cronenberg is highlighting the other thing too is they were like he was like all right this guy's awful what let's kick it up one more notch what can we have him else do that's disgusting while he's talking about this pedophilia oh let's have him double fisting his lunch I just have a pickle in a sandwich and eat yeah, yeah. Just go into town while he's telling this story. Sandwich first, then pickle. Pickle first, then sandwich. Never the twain shall meet. I did think it was funny when he said, hey, this pickle's used. Yeah, you tossed me <laughs> a, a used line. pickle. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a good gag. I just couldn't think of a body part that pickle would be referencing. So that was confusing <laughs> no, Yeah, me. nor I. It was yeah. <laughs> middle um, toe. Well, I think that so much of cult exploitation B film, like when you start looking at the similarities between all of the different factions, you know, black exploitation, sex exploitation and and snuff films in some way. Like these are movies that are obsessed with the body. Mm-hmm. They're obsessed with the body in whatever in, in you know whatever form and and facet that it takes in that specific, you know, uh uh genre, that specific, you know, body horror. Um and so to me like the obsession with orifices is so baked in to horror comedy and porn that like it makes sense that this movie kind of feels like all three there's no way that you can kind of divorce the body from what cronenberg's doing and i think that yeah the, specifically the the scene where nicholas's stomach that looked like his stomach going up and down like that when he was talking oh and he was like, yeah my friend oh that gave me <laughs> like the, the little jitters i couldn't stand that it. was gro- that was i think the creepiest part of the i think that was the grossest body scene in the entire in the entire i think there's something else that we have to talk about a scene like that too like you know maybe there's no place in this movie because this movie's got a lot going on but we are seeing a man shirtless with and his stomach is moving around with the living thing inside of him and uh, that always makes me question the it, it happens in a lot more movies than you would think it makes me question the director's thoughts on women because it, it, yeah. it is sort of a way of saying women are now unnecessary. Men can get pregnant. If you can see the baby <laughs> kicking, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's I, there's not a lot of women with agency here. We do have, it's most of the, uh, I don't know, the protagonists, if you can say that, are dudes. And most of the victims are women. Like, it, it doesn't, yeah. it's not until like there's like 30 minutes left in the movie where, and it's a, like a person of color too, gets attacked. And he's the first guy to actually go down you know most of these yeah. are women attacks if you want yeah. to further that it, pregnant oh just if you want to further that pregnancy metaphor when the doctor comes in and he rips the blanket off the guy as he's laying in bed there and it's just all the parasites are around they're being born of his belly and then you know he gets attacked yeah. but that gets yeah intense. the original parasite is a human fetus <laughs> and the obsession that we have with body horror with sex with co- you know, like even like funny women they're typically fat or they you know there's a grotesque element to it i think it has everything to do with our fear of the female uh i was actually reading 
a very interesting op-ed earlier this week because uh, I had a I had an IUD implantation earlier this week that went very poorly. I fainted from pain, and so I was reading up on it because they're not you don't have any localized anesthesia for women when you do that, and um, uh, and so people are like, why in the fuck are we doing this procedure without any like that? And there is a line from it that I was like, Oh my God, this is exactly right with shivers that said like the kind of pain you are feeling when you're like forcing a cervix open and you're like, you know, all of that kind of graphic stuff, everything in your body, everything in your humanity is telling you this is wrong. This is really dangerous and you're trying to run away from it, but it's inside of you. And so the person was like, it's less like pain and more like body horror. And so to me, like when you are talking about body horror, it is almost always some kind of parallel, at least to like a female body's like like the 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 possession of these creatures and the the way it destroys and the, like the otherworldly freakiness of life and how you know it's as it's as primal as it gets. I, I definitely it's, it's the Bible, right? Like the whole Adam <laughs> and Eve story is body horror. It's the realization yeah. that you're gross. That's yeah, that's the exactly. ultimate kick out of paradise is oh <laughs> I should cover this shit up. Like <laughs> it's that's shameful. crazy. And yeah, Kate, yeah. to your point, I see this something like this so much more a body horror than something like Saw, where it's just, oh, you cut off a mm-hmm. foot. Like, we can all fucking cut off a foot. It's fine. Yeah, you know, yeah. we'll do it I'll if do we have it to. do it right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the whole dealing with the obvious repulsion of what it is to procreate and mm-hmm. all of this normal stuff. That is body yeah. horror. Yeah, that's body horror. Body horror requires like a conversation around the female every single time. It has something to do if you peel it back with like our horror with the reality of like a female body ha- growing a parasite, that parasite breaking her body down, the blood, the guts, the afterbirth, the, the poop, the, mm-hmm. the poop, like <laughs> everything about it. We are everything in us is fascinated with it and disgusted by it and afraid of it. And I think that Cronenberg unflinchingly looking at like a dude's pregnant slug belly it's loaded yeah well and that, that'll continue because like his his crash 1997 the better crash uh the not hacky crash uh they get in car accidents while they're fucking and at a certain point somebody's a woman's thigh gets like gashed open in the car crash and a guy mm-hmm. fucks that i think yeah. his whole point yeah. is like look at this like it's a, from an alien we're doing weird shit to each other people it's all <laughs> yeah. nasty yeah, like he yeah. does not let this go. That just human existence and and what women have to go through is pretty bummer city. Mm-hmm. Well, this does feel like we are slowly but surely making our way to our second taste bud. So when we're back, <laughs> we'll be talking about sex, baby. Hola, Filterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. There, depending on what tier you pick, $1 a month, $5 a month. If you're crazy, anything more than $5 a month, don't do that. You can get extra content. There's extra shows, extra series, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, You can pay for ryan to draw you a picture Uh, i can write you a poem you can get the shirts off our very own backs all of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter while you're on the internet you should check out shady monk he does all the tunes you've been listening to he's on Bandcamp. he's on spotify uh soundcloud wherever kids get their music these days that i'm too old to know shady monk lives there uh you can probably follow him on twitter and instagram as well that's shady monk wherever you get music Check them out. Sexuality is one of Shiver's major themes. I think that it's probably at least touched on in every single scene in this movie. What do you think Cronenberg was trying to investigate? And, and do you think he did it successfully? Nate, let's go to you. You know, at first I thought that he was trying to look at uh, maybe puritanical fear of sexuality. But then as the uh, as the movie progressed and we got to the point where like a mom and a eight year old girl double team a guy in an elevator, I was like, oh, no, this isn't about sex norms. This is about maybe sexually transmitted rape culture or just the inherent brutal nature of sex as it is. Right. Like it mm-hmm. it, it is animalistic and mm-hmm. and it 
basically just turns everybody into violent super creeps. And that's sort of all <laughs> that it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. There's enough references to like pedophilia mm -hmm. throughout all of this that make you feel like there is an awareness of like the inherent exploitation and like violence to sexuality in people that's sublimated in other stuff. Um, I mean, how did, how did you feel about it, Mike? Yeah, it does feel like there's, he's, based on this, that he's saying there's grossness in all of us, and some people wear a suit and tie, but it'll still come out. Like, it's almost like the, the, the more you push down, I guess that goes to the puritanical. But what's so interesting that makes it say, like, all sex is a little weird, is that some of them turn into, uh, I'm going to bite your throat out why I try to rape you, zombies. And some mm -hmm. are like, look at my 70s chest hair. Want to come with me to this room? Like, they're, they're, they're still like, <laughs> there's still a bit of seduction in them mm -hmm. while they're mm -hmm. also still sex crave zombies. And, and so it's like, he is saying, like, no matter what kind of sex you're trying to have, man, it's fucking weird and gross, which goes to the <laughs> Nate's, like, it's animalistic at its very core. I read yeah. a quote from him that was like, oh, if there's like, um, I don't know. If there's stuff that negates each other about the way that the slugs work, um, or the 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 parasite or whatever, um, that was on purpose or it wasn't, I don't remember. And so <laughs> I guess we'll just leave it leave that it. That seems like the kind of guy who directed this movie. <laughs> yeah, I just felt a bit confused. Um I think I, I definitely interpreted, I guess, the blurred lines between like the you know the sex and the violence and like the sex and the romance there just because i couldn't tell how the parasite worked because it was you know some of them would just like want to you know bone down but then the others were just like all right now i'm gonna try and kill you while i do so so that part i was a bit confused on for sure and some yeah. people became gay or somewhere on on a, a sexual spectrum oh yeah just kind there of out is... of nowhere there was a fair amount, actually, because there was a lesbian couple and a gay couple near the end, you know, that try and stalk down the um, hallway. But uh, that that kind of, um, I found, uh, an interesting turn because you don't really see that too much, I feel like, in the early 70s. Yeah. I, I, as much as I thought that the the slugs were confusing about, like, what their whole plan was, I thought, I, I, don't, I bounced back and forth, sort of like Nate did, with what he was trying to say. And I think it's... It, it, a lot of it is like, yeah, I think if, once we think we're safe, we're still not because we're going to fuck each other to death. You know, like we will find a way to destroy whatever community we create. Um, but then I think that there was also like a sex positive side, too, of like all, all of these people's lives sucked until Party Slug <laughs> came and made them all rock. But I, I think that's yeah. why my, my leaning is this is not a good movie. And I said, sorry, is when when they're acting differently about sex. I'm not like, oh, Cronenberg's saying sexuality is nuanced. It seems like a guy who doesn't know what he's trying to say. And sometimes yeah. it does seem like he's like, wouldn't it be great if a Ravs woman tried to just fuck you even if you didn't want it? And other times he's like, this is horrific. <laughs> and again, it doesn't seem like this is a complicated <laughs> worldview and how, how the world deals with sex. It just seems like a guy being like, today I felt like it was cool. Tomorrow I thought it was awful. Let's keep on we'll making this talk movie. about human sexuality. Yeah. I mean, you know, if yeah. anything, that's it, more indicative of, of kind <laughs> of like the reality of all of our relationships but to sex. There's times like, I don't think oh, it's yeah. on purpose. No, I don't. I, yeah, like that I, I, last, right. the last scene when, when Mumblecore Doctor gets uh, attacked in the pool, yes. it sure reminded me of Monty Python and the Meaning of Life, wherein there's a scene where a man wants to die just by being chased by topless women off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was a similar mm -hmm. like, oh, everybody's just jumping into the pool. This is like the end of a sitcom episode. But <laughs> yeah. this guy's going to finally get fucked to death because watch out, white men. Like, I, I thought that was a thing, too. It was, it, it was, mm -hmm. I had a hard time figuring out who the actual protagonist was because yeah, the nurse seemed like the most competent person and one of the best actors in the film. But <laughs> yeah, but she was also like not. I mean, she wasn't given anything. It's like, okay, can well, here's Strip before you've been slugged and then true. you get abandoned. The end. Can we get but back to uh, Mumbly Joe, though, real quick? Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I've, I've never seen a performance like this in my entire life. Um, it, was, mm -hmm. it was like they, they put rocks in his mouth and then the boom guy just threw the mic as far as he could <laughs> away from him every time he started to talk as he just ate his words. This is... <laughs> I like there are porn actors who are like this guy's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I kind of loved him. I thought there was something incredibly compelling about his weird like theatrical naturalism of like his kind of character, you know, like there was um 
he, yeah, he sounds like that, and there is something appealing about it. But going back to the nurse, um, because to me, there was one line when she's describing the fucked up erotic dream that she had before the slug, you know, slips out of her mouth. Um, there are a couple of lines that I were that I thought were like must be keys to the movie Mm -hmm. in some way. They were the most potently poetic at the very least. Um, And so I I have the lineup right here, but then he tells me that everything is erotic, that everything is sexual. You know what I mean? He tells me that even old flesh is erotic flesh, that disease is the love of two alien kinds of creatures for each other. That's fucking crazy to me. <laughs> that even dying is an act of eroticism. That talking is sexual. That breathing is sexual. Yeah, that I mean, first of all, this is 1975. Is so hell yeah, right? It's 1975, <laughs> and it reads. <laughs> but also, what do you guys want to bet that this was in the script to be shot? And they were like, oh, we have no money. Just have her sit there and talk about the dream, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I see there being a dream sequence absolutely there. Yeah. But it does like bring to mind, again, that with the old flesh um, is erotic. Well, so... In that case, young flesh must be as well. And that just ties back in with all like the young girl imagery. And that, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that oof, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the making this making everything sexual. I think that there's something to me that reg- that rings true. That's very uncomfortable. Like be, I mean, in terms of like the, the line specifically that even to physically exist is sexual. I think that on some level has to be just biologically true. Like Mm -hmm. you're, you know what I mean? And so there is a, there is an overwhelming compulsion to all physical forms to procreate. And the way humans do it is involves transmission and parasitic growth. And it took all of those themes to the extreme and I were and and kind of revealed like this is a horrifying thing. What do you think though was the importance of the doctor who came up with this entire plan saying we've lost touch with our animalism, we've lost touch with this basic primal thing, we're too cerebral, so my goal is to bring us back there. Why do you think that's relevant, Ryan? See, I don't, I I was I kept going back to what Mike said because I don't I understand what Mike said about how maybe he just sucks, maybe he's a moron, and doesn't know how to make a movie, but I want to see if we can dig deeper than that about the ultimate al- seemingly alternating feelings towards sex. And one thing I was thinking is that the the uptight tie wearers all think about sex one way, and then like the cool groovy seventies people think about sex the other way. And there's so like the doctors really, um. I don't know. They're the ones who think of sex in a different way that maybe it is bad. The, uh, but the guy the, that the, waits in the waiting room at the doctor's office and hits on every woman thinking about sex a different way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and he's, he's definitely a horn dog, but the, the, the pickle eater, the doctor, he's got a bumper sticker on his fridge that says sex is the invention of a clever venereal disease. <laughs> so going back to wow, like, so I didn't catch that. What you were talking about in the last segment, Kate, of just like yeah, it's all fucking gross. It's all gross. It, and it's mm-hmm. interesting that it is the two doctors, the one we see in the first scene who kills himself, who who you know pours acid in the in the child's stomach he's been sleeping with for seven years, and then the other one who's like, well, here's what's going on. Uh, both of them seem like the grossest people because neither of them, when we meet them in theory, are infected, and they are still fucking nasty about sex. Which ties I it back think it to makes like, sense. Isn't it all? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it totally makes it. sense that um, that the doctors have this totally like weird animalistic like objective view of how humans treat sex because that's like they, most doctors are probably like it's like a surgeon, someone that like has to go into people every single day is just going to see someone as like a, a like see a person as it's all uh, clinical. It's all clinical. Meat exactly. Sack. Exactly. So I think it totally makes sense that those doctors, like, they'll have different takes on it, but that they see sex as, like, a disease where, you know, as as per the poster on the wall, or just something that is inherently natural, because we're just machines on a different level. Yeah. But yeah, so, yeah. like, maybe wonder... the argument is that we're not machines. If we all treated sex like machines, then we would all be as rapey as this parasite wants us to be. You know, so uh, it's, okay, it is yeah. about underst- understanding that it comes with feelings and wants and desires of both parties. It, it's just both weird. parties have to express. It's weird when the, the, the two doctors who could be saying that are the pro pedophile group 
in the film. Yeah. And, and so no that's it's it's not weird. It made me think a lot about <laughs> like in the seventies, uh, there's, there's just rampant cults going on and rampant, mm-hmm. like the, the, the perversion of the free love movement, right? If it was ever like a good movement from the sixties, yeah. there, there's the disgusting sexual cults. And there was a lot of like so many musical heroes were just sleeping with 12 and 14 year old girls cause they put mm-hmm. on makeup. So it does feel like yeah. Cronenberg's like, see what you're all fucking doing. Yeah. And I wonder what would change in the movie if those doctors were female, mm. um, how that how we would read that story differently, um, I think that that would that would change everything. You know, I, I, mean, it, I think if they were female, then they would then the doctors would just change on camera for no reason instead of the nurses changing on camera for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fair, very fair. Um, so we're out of time for talking about sex, which is regrettable because. <laughs> A famously interesting topic to everyone. Uh, But when we're back, we're talking zombies. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to pop filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie. Everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property. And Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's YourPopFilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! There are obviously a lot of parallels in early... I'm going to cut that because my phone fell. There are obviously a lot of parallels between early Cronenberg and Romero. Um, Romero's zombie movies famously tackled topics like capitalism, racism, the military industrial complex. So what is Cronenberg actually talking about in Shivers and, and what does it add to the zombie genre? How is it interacting with the ideas of cinematic zombies? Um, Van, I mean, do you, do you, are you a zombie fan? I actually am not. I dislike most zombie flicks, but this one I I was I was more engaged with because it took a different turn. I think that the aspect of, you know, the the sex aspect definitely brought um a whole different level to the zombies because you, know, you just once you see one zombie zombie, you know that it's a disease, it'll get carried on to others and it's kind of the same movie in my opinion, um if it's generally mm-hmm. if it's an apocalypse uh with the zombies. But um I I I think it yeah, there's definitely, I think, strong ties between, like, uh, I think there's also the rise of a lot of, like, sexually transmitted diseases in, like, the 70s, um, and it has to speak on that and what, like, sex and free will is doing to the population. It's going to turn all of the people like this. Of course, in the end, when everyone's leaving happily in their couples out with, in the cars, um, headed to the main city to infect everyone, it's just uh, about broadening that message. But I, I think the sex aspect changed up the zombie um, portrayal a little bit for me. Do you know how hard yeah. it is to organize any party, but especially party of zombies, and just be like, "All right, who's driving now? I need <laughs> two people per car." Yeah. Remember the yeah. bike yeah. system. Who is organizing the carpool? <laughs> Who is who's like, okay, we're meeting at this bar at this time. <laughs> they also all <laughs> they calmed down. They weren't sex crazed anymore. I don't get how that ebbs and flows. They were just happily, you know, jamming out and driving to the big city. I bet it is like. I think, I mean, in, in some way, it's just a parallel to human sexuality where it's like, well, I'm getting to the bar. Till then, I'll enjoy these sweet tunes. Like, <laughs> but well, and, I'll and be there's a also rapey zombie there. <laughs> there's also a commentary on kind of the, the, at least men and sex, and like, once you've slept with somebody, you don't have to again in the mm-hmm. 70s. Like, if you're mm-hmm. in that, like, yeah. just one night <laughs> stand culture, everybody, like, once you're infected with it, it's it's over like not really interested yeah. in you anymore because now you're mm-hmm. now you're part of the club so it's not important and oh, that's you can't true. somebody shot. twice if we're talking about zombie rules zombies rule uh <laughs> 
that that also gets muddied because at the end it's like, well, they're all zombified, so of course they're done. But they are all zombies sleeping with each other the whole movie until the end when it's like narratively convenient to be like, ooh, they're going to the big city. Uh, I, I think his focus is muddier than Romero's. I mean, Romero's films are you know all over the place in quality to like in throughout the series but each one is pretty narrowly focused in what it wants to do and mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. with the fact that cronenberg doesn't narrow his lens i think makes it a sloppier movie and yeah. i love different zombies i'm not one of those who were like zombies got fast in 2000s that was dumb fuck it there's great fast <laughs> zombie movies that's awesome change change the genre as you will i would love a great sex zombie movie i just don't know if shivers is it I felt like this was actually more like The Shining than any zombie movie. Uh, the Shining, Nate. Why? Dude. The Shining. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, the Shining. Tell us. Tell us. Because we have we have a focus on a place. We get we get a lot of expositional voiceover about this place and how fantastic it is and what an achievement it is. The same way The Overlook mm-hmm. is an incredible achievement. There is something weird about it because it's isolated on an island who builds a a tower on an island in the middle of nowhere kind of thing and then you're basically dealing with a similar kind of it possesses however it feels like sort of ghost right like the the spirit of the overlook hotel gets jack torrance however it kind of needs to when it needs to so sometimes he's horny sometimes he's angry sometimes he's sleepy sometimes he wants a drink sometimes and, he's an axie yeah <laughs> And and this sometimes, movie, hey, sometimes we're hacksy. <laughs> sometimes we feel a little stabby. We got it. We got to chop somebody up. Um, but yeah, <laughs> and the and the and the the slugs kind of do the same thing. It's sort of like they do whatever's necessary to move the plot forward, which is a type of like it's almost like the the possession here is not by it's not like zombies. It's not zombification, but it's just sort of like the screenwriter needs the ability to conduct this. However. And mm. here's our here's our artifice to do so. What so it's actually you, like meta. It's like possession by possession by, by filmmaking. Yeah, which which is why <laughs> the zombies the, the 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 infected react differently. It it gave me huge Gremlins two vibes with the here's how great the high rise tower is. Ooh, which yeah. is maybe but and but like less fun. There's no professor slug. There's no sexy slug. Which There's I no could spider use. slug or no bat spider slug. slug, bat slug. Uh, uh, no sexy slug. That's a personal yeah. value judgment. <laughs> we'll talk about I'll, we'll talk I'll about have that you bathroom. Leave my baby opinion later. out of this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think The Shining is perfect too because th- although the Starline Express or whatever the the apartment complex is called. <laughs> um, is not from Gremlins too. I do think that the that Jack Torrance goes a little crazy because you know all work and no play. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that that's what he's sort of saying with the the apartment complex is we're going to give you what you want and we're going to put all the amenities here so you have nothing to think about. And that's when you start to fucking lose your mind. I think that and but and basically everybody's going to start to live the same life. You know that's what we're doing is we're all moving here. And we're all going to have the same life, and it's all going to be done for you, and that's when you get bored. But I think that there's something lost in the translation because, you know, 40 years later or whatever it is, we all want that. We're like, uh, that looks sweet. I don't care. Uh, I'll conform if it takes that to yeah. like, get all of those amenities. If so, there's also a doctor in my sweet apartment yeah, that a I currently dentist? live in. Honey, if I there's never dental, dental yeah, come on. I'll do this job. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think that then yeah. they were like, we absolutely cannot conform. That is the worst thing you can do. That is death. You know, that's when you become a zombie is when you conform because everybody in the suburbs are zombies. And mm-hmm. we're like, no, we'll conform in order to have our teeth worked on a little bit. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah zombification is is the way that in the specific genre and the specific medium, we interact with like group think mm. in a way that we are intimidated by. We're intimidated by the lack or the loss of humanity by like you know, some sort of infection from other people that becomes endemic. Um, And so this movie's like priority at the very beginning of this advertisement about this streamlined life where you don't have to think about things. Everything is provided to you. Any sort of like natural animalistic, like I need to hunt. I need to find shelter. I need to take care of myself. All removed. Is this why everybody on Facebook calls me, it calls me sheeple. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or you are soy boy. Ball. Why do they call me soy boy? <laughs> You're soy boy. You have, soy boy are beautiful. I love the phrase soy boy. I think that's such a cute. I call all of the best men in the world soy boys. <laughs> Adorable <laughs> soy boys. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. Yeah, y'all are soy boys. Yeah, you guys wear it with pride. Um, so yeah, there. But there, there is something like it is an intentional juxtaposition between the ease of like streamlined model T style Fordist manufacturing lifestyle sort of shit. And a doctor saying we have lost touch with the entropy of flesh and we need to like go back there. And, uh, and the way to do that is to put a parasite in us that is more human than we are and that it is going for what it wants based on instinct and oh, you know, overtaking our organs and doing the job better than better better than we would. Can't would. you see Cronenberg like saying about the movie like the real horror show is the complacency of the people in the beginning of the movie? Man, that's what's really <laughs> scary. Do you, Dude, it's 1975. Do you think that means he loved or hated Wally for doing the message better? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what Cronenberg's take on Wally is. You know, he's never, a, that is he's a notoriously prickly question. person. I, I don't think he's ever enjoyed anything ever. <laughs> I mean, has he seen Wally? Uh, that's I mean, a question. it's a sweet movie. Wally's undeniable. Hello, Dolly. Wally's undeniable. It's a good one. Uh, like airplanes. <laughs> 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 My other favorite Pixar movie. It's just planes. Um, it's just dude. planes. <laughs> I thought you just meant uh, the concept of I'm airplanes. I'm sorry. I, I respect <laughs> them Mike. enough to call them airplanes. <laughs> that is stupid. It's just called planes. Yeah, that's what's stupid no about that movie. Yeah, that's the worst part of that movie. <laughs> it was going to be uh, wing cars, so planes is not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> wing cars. Um, yeah. Dude, Dude, zombies. Right? I don't know. So, uh, who here is a zombie fan? A zombie? They're going to say zombie. Just oh yeah, yeah. Both. Well, yeah. All of us are zombies. We're all capitalist shills. But Hell Mike, yeah. you were like, "This is my low key identity." Before we let, tell me how you felt. About this. Before okay. we let Mike and Nate go off on zombies, Kate, do you do you remember that you and I met talking about George Romero's Day of the I Dead? I do. That was our, yeah. That was our first date. That was our first date. It was such a lovely time. And it reminded me how fun it was to talk about movies. Unfortunately, right, guys? Unfortunately, now we have to listen to Mike and Nate talk. I yeah. know, but we were good at I'll it. You, you and I, we were really good at it. So you guys go ahead and freaking try. That was your meat cute M E A T. It was. <laughs> I was in a hair turban from a shower and uh, saying that Tompkins should kill himself. I believe none of this is a lie. <laughs> none of that's a lie. <laughs> Nate, zombie fan, go. Yeah, okay. So. The thing that this movie is missing that is my favorite and the most compelling part of zombie films is how do people respond to the world gone mm. zombie? This doesn't have anybody but Mumble Dog Roger and and uh, and Nurse Forsyth running around. Forsyth, right? Running away. That's her she's friggin' name. Villain. And that's it. And then he yeah. just like abandons her the instant that they get in the storage unit area. And it's like, oh, we're surrounded. Well, okay, bye. <laughs> well, Nate, you've been shopping the storage unit. And you just yeah. got to get away from your woman. You know, sometimes <laughs> it's, you're in an Ikea. I get it. Um, yeah. But yeah. It, A bachelor's <laughs> paradise. <laughs> the, 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 Ikea. Yeah, I, I do think I, I agree, Nate, that the, the point of every zombie film is The Walking Dead are the humans. And... This one doesn't have that. You, you do want people bouncing off of each other to figure out what they're going to do next. I think it would. There, the slow parts would be less slow. The messages, if there are any, would be a little solidified in this movie if there were humans to talk to each other instead of just a new different mm -hmm. version of a horny zombie going Bleh! and the guy going ah yeah. and running down the a hall. A doctor's understanding of a sexual parasites like endemic nature is simply not the conversation that's interesting about zombies right like that's fundamentally like i am looking to have a human right think about these things yeah you want yeah. humans who aren't freaky ass doctors to be able to talk mm -hmm. about like uh like synthesize what he said and he's like well this doctor said this and then they get to have that discussion and then we're all like oh that's what it means to greater society yeah, I would have been happy yeah. if any if like if David Schwimmer and his wife had like a normal <laughs> normal sort of world of common day marital arc before. Yeah, he that would have been a changing. great solution. But mm -hmm. instead it's just like we jump right in. We clearly have villain doctor killing underage girl, killing himself, 
And then David Schwimmer's all creeped out. He's like just staring in the mirror, poking himself and being very distant. And then you're like, oh, and yeah. you're also cheating on your wife. Cool. Yeah. That's in, really some, not enough. in some way, it would have been so much more compelling to start that storyline in which they're like somehow a happily married normative couple that then falls prey to this whole system. Right. Like that'll show us like that. you That'll let us track what's going on. And that's who you this think the first universes. people we saw were, right? Like the first yeah. couple who toured the Starliner aren't even yeah. in the movie. They have They're a not cameo even in the at movie. the end of the movie. But, yes. But yes, instead exactly. of like, oh, hey, you're you're entering this world with these two people. No, no, mm-hmm. we don't care about that. <laughs> Yeah. To be fair, though, everyone has a cameo at the end of the movie where they're all back on the hill. We get to celebrate with all of our friends, and I cannot believe there was there was not a musical number there. How great with that <laughs> yeah. singing, dancing. The boys are it. back in town. The boys are back in town. I have to say, though, that shot Zombies was really rule. cool. That shot when he's yeah. running up and when he's just slowly from left to right, all the bodies coming in. That looked good. Well, that's Romero. That's what I saw. I was like, oh, this is the end of oh, Romero. Yeah, you film, know. Right? Like the slowness and the and the realizing the outnumbered element of it, the, the fatality of all of it. Um, yeah, that was, that was a cool shot. Um, when we're back, we're going to give out some freaking awards. <gasps> Are you guys ready? So ready. Yes. So ready. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> well, that is very, very funny or very sad. And perhaps now you have something to think about or very problematic. And perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at Your Pop Filter. Email contacts at Your Pop Filter. Hey, everybody. Keep watching them movies. And now, my dear taste buds, it's time to give out some awards. So today we are going through kind of our three mainstays. The big, the big three. The Holy Trinity of Moody Awards. We're talking cringiest moment. We're talking director's signature. And we're talking friggin' best performance, pound for pound. <laughs> so let's start with cringiest moment. This will be a complicated one, I think. Um, uh, Mike, tell us what you cringed at We've most. We've talked about it throughout this whole episode, I think because it's cringiest moment. is It is when Living Doctor is telling Roger Mumble, Mumble's core, uh, What's going on? And he's just like, well, that girl who was prepubescent who died in the beginning, you know they were fucking shit. She was 12. You know how it goes. And the fact yeah. that the guy doesn't go, <laughs> what? It, it's, it's that whole conversation about their relationship and nobody's like, stop right now? Yeah. Well, if he, yeah, he said, just politely nods. No, he no, just no, politely no, nods. No. And the way oh, the man yeah. gave, the way Pickle Doctor gave the information was brutal yeah it was like yeah they were caught she was he was caught giving her a titty exam <laughs> in the faculty lounge she was 12 that dude was crazy <laughs> but he, that, he says it with like a laugh like that guy was crazy yeah, you're gonna like, school not like the rest of rough. us in our vans <laughs> <laughs> uh what about you van all right uh hard to top that one actually uh but i'd have to say yeah. you know when he's uh we got roger mumbles he's uh running down the hallway he turns he goes down the stairs turns left and there are two eight-year-old girls on chains um in like How on dog we leashes. Talk about this? yeah so yeah brief, so potent oh yeah. yeah i i had to pause it i had to pause it and be like go back and rewatch it i was like oh no that was there i didn't imagine that no that happened that yeah. wasn't my brain okay yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, that yeah. that's that's my unaddressed uh-huh. you know oh what? yeah you know- that's a good one van <laughs> It also, what were you going to say? It also harkens back no, to... No, Ryan, they, shut up. Van was going to oh, say Oh, no, I was just going to say, it felt, because, like, there's a couple, like, pedophilic moments in the very beginning, like, beginning of Act 2, and then it just kind of dropped off for a while, and then it showed back up, rearing its head in the end. So yeah, that's why it got me. and then you see me. two eight-year-olds being walked, and you're like, okay, this is a lot of levels of don't know things. Of unneeded, <laughs> unnecessary. Ryan, you now have the floor. Uh, first of all, if you've ever been to Disneyland on a busy day, you see that shit all the time. Like, <laughs> You're fucked. Oh, no lie. The all right. sexiest place on earth. <laughs> but also, it, I think it harkens back to what Nate said, because it's the same thing of Jack Torrance running down the hallways and looking in rooms and seeing chubby guys yes. that look like Barf from Spaceballs blowing old men on the on the bed. You know, It's just like, all right, yeah. everything that we didn't put in the movie yet, let's put it in now. Go, 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 go. Yeah, go. yeah, 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 yeah. How can I upset someone... With two seconds of unimage. That's how you do it. Got it. (laughs) 
Land it. <laughs> what about you, Nate? Cringiest moment? Um, you know, it, it's a tie for me between the the little girl who like leans down to kiss the security guard. Yeah, that's after they rough. come out of the elevator. Yeah. Um, because it's like it's a very conscious choice to go with. She's going to be the one to pass the parasite. She's on. the one. That's who, how yeah. we do yeah. this in slow with motion our, with our Bobo Don knots. Slow motion close up of this eight year old kissing the security guard and passing a sexually transmitted horny parasite david 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 yeah. Ew, david david are you <laughs> thinking david. about this as hard yes. as you should be i, I don't oh, think he's thinking about it hard <laughs> no <laughs> ryan what about you cringiest moment uh my cringiest moment is uh also one of my favorites um when adam driver is uh he just wants to get rid of it so he decides he's just gonna be on the ledge or on his balcony and throws up and <laughs> it, the slug runs away but not before two old women are walking by and it's not raining, but this lady has an umbrella to protect her from the sun, but the umbrella is clear and not tinted. What are you doing with that umbrella, lady? Baking. That's, so you, would you want a, a magnifying Cringe. glass? That's my cringiest moment, lady. Deal, learn how to deal with the sun. Yeah. These are all excellent, but you guys are all wrong. The cringiest moment is in the movie is when they remind you that in the 70s and 80s, they put carpets in bathrooms and atop <laughs> toilets. Um, well, what else is going to suck up the piss in the air, Kate? <laughs> in the air? <laughs> That's the so airborne gross piss and particles. Funny, Mike. You just want to step out of the shower and everything is like a damp movie theater floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mike has a real That's garden so sprinkler style of pissing. So. <laughs> so, our next award, I think, is specifically interesting giving our director, right? Director's signature. I am not speaking from a place of expertise. Who here is, and they may be the first to start. I'll go. I want to get mine yeah, out Ryan. there first. I'll mm -hmm. talk, Kate. Um, yeah. I think that... I've been very good about prompting people, but that one I didn't know who was ready to actually talk about Cronenberg's filmography, because I could not. You also haven't been good about complimenting yourself until right now. I'm so glad you gave me that little... Gave yourself that little compliment. Mm -hmm. um, on the back. <laughs> it's the bathtub scene. The bathtub scene, I think, is legendary for what it yeah. shows and what it does not show. We see... The slug comes through the drain, mm -hmm. which is both gross and hilarious because he just pops up and he's like, hello. And <laughs> it, What's going on? this is the close up where it just looks like a pee pee. I'm going to be honest. And then it just looks like a pee pee. It slides in between the legs and then off camera. And I think that's important that we yeah. Hitchcock like we don't see anything else past that um, because I think that. I anything more would gross Cronenberg out too much. Like, <laughs> ew, <laughs> bodies and sex. That's gross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I loved that scene. That was the one, because we talked about the struggle with suspense throughout this entire mm -hmm. movie. I don't think it's very good at creating suspense. That The composition of that scene, you know what's going to happen. You're waiting for it to happen. You're like, okay, that straight up dick is about to fuck <laughs> that unsuspecting tub goer. And it's going to be violent. Wait. And everything was realized. <laughs> well, and it was it was pretty restrained, too, because there's no nudity mm -hmm. in that scene. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is the one scene when you would assume from any pulpy horror movie that there would be nudity. But no. Yeah. Just a bathtub scene. He's surprising yeah. you. None. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great scene. Good choice, Ryan. Uh, what about you, Nate? I think it is the scene when uh, fake David Schwimmer's mouth poops out the parasite. It slowly slides mm -hmm. out of his mouth very much like uh, a nice little poop job it, and that was super gross a poop job poop job <laughs> <laughs> this i get poop jobs if i'm healthy once a day the actor pushes out the thing with his tongue and then sticks out his tongue for a long time like yeah we know how you right? did it yeah. yeah i was also what are you what, he's like no waiting hands. for another fucking slug to come out and it wasn't it was just his goddamn tongue and i was like i am confused by what you want me to look at right now <laughs> Van, cringiest moment. Well, uh, I believe that we've already done cringiest moment, but on terms of what makes... Oh, fuck, right. <laughs> and by that, I mean directors. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, okay, that's a Freudian slip that comes with, like, to me, Cronenberg's They're signature cringy, is man. kind of cringiest oh, moment, yeah. right? Like, yeah. it's, you know, For but sure. that's me imposing that on you. You tell me what Cronenberg's signature All is. All right. Well, honestly, I had written down Ryan's uh, moment in the bathtub scene because I think that is, like, just the epitome of Cronenberg's, like, realization moment. There's the slow dawning of, like, because that, that death marks when the deaths start happening rapid fire in the movie but outside of that mm -hmm. when nathan is or nicholas uh you know david schwimmer he's lying in bed and he's his his belly is just convulsing and he's talking to it that really i felt was um 
was yeah. was mm-hmm. very Cronenberg esque. Yeah. Wait. So it seems like you you know Cronenberg. You're Cronenberg. I, I like I know of fella. of him. I haven't seen all of his works. Um, I saw a couple of his shorts that came out before Shivers and uh, the Flying Videodrome. Mm-hmm. But he has some like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. signature. He has a lot of say in the camera work, and so that's what I really admire. So he's got some signature shots, mm-hmm. and just the one resting like medium wide, and it's just having the character be by themselves for that moment, and them realizing what what's going on and you know having like the audience see what's going on inside that character's head at the moment of the transformation is i think very Mm -hmm. pinnacle to him Mm -hmm. i like that too that whole like both the character and the audience all at the same time going oh okay i see what this movie's Mm -hmm. about okay (laughs) we're all on board Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah if there was any confusion dispelled (laughs) (laughs) mike yeah, I, director I, signature. I think it has to be the bathtub. Cronenberg is like one of these, you know, Corman type directors who people are like, I've heard of him. I don't think I've seen people know the fly. Right. And then Van just schooled us all by saying a bunch of other stuff that he's come out with. Uh, yeah. But that bathtub scene is in movies like it, it, it's signature enough that people have been ripping it off since this movie. Freddie's hand mm-hmm. uh, show up in the bathtub doing that in uh, slither again james slither. Gunn does it and mm-hmm. uh you do see it but it goes into the mouth uh which is never sexual a slug thing going to the mouth the uh, bad jack frost the horror the movie ba- jack I've frost i've never had a sexual thought about a mouth in my life the bad jack frost with michael <laughs> keaton the character just goes yes. straight towards him in the bathtub <laughs> that was um, his son mike <laughs> i call kids carrots uh so yeah i, I think it, it's I, I wish i had a different one the only different one i would have is the one van said so fuck everybody yeah. <laughs> yeah i think you guys are all right i think you labeled the two not only the two like signature cronenberg moments but to me sincerely and i guess this is why we say this is like the first big movie of an eventual master and auteur is that those two things that are distinctly his are the most interesting scenes in the movie. And I, they are via composition as well as theme and execution. Like those are, you don't want to look away during those scenes. Kate, you and I might be the least versed on horror movies out of the five of us, but mm-hmm. probably I, for Oops. me, you guys can agree or disagree, but for me, like as a horror movie fades, the two, three, four greatest set pieces remain and the rest just falls away. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's totally. why I do think that shivers yeah. will like stick in my brain is because I I won't remember the twelve boring minutes, you know, in the middle. But like, uh, I think there in was the middle, three... do you mean twelve boring minutes after every three minutes of fun? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, mer- agreed. Sh- <laughs> yeah, no, I Ryan, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. So everyone is right. Congratulations. I'm being socialist about it. We've all, we're all a part of this, equal parts. We are ready now for pound for pound performance. I'd like to know. Ooh, it's so hard. I feel like there must be a pattern. I'm I'm interested. You know what? I'm going to just go ahead and throw it to Nate. Pound for pound performance. I think it's it's creepy doctor Rolo Linsky who gets to be Dick Halloran at the end of the movie too. He's supposed yeah. to be the hero. He immediately gets dispatched by the by the bad. And uh and he's the most interesting. I mean, he's a super gross character, but he's the most like when he's on screen it's actually kind of compelling to listen to even if it's all horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This is my pick, and I can tell you why it's Nate's and mine. Listen to Nate talk. Listen to the doctor talk. They got those voices. <laughs> like they both have those voices. And also Nate t- holding a pickle, and I don't know why he's doing that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we're calling it these days. It's, okay. it's used. He's stupid. <laughs> it's a used pickle. That's. Uh, let's hope at this point, Mike. Uh, I want to shout out. I don't know the actor's name, but sex party homie who is fully zombified sees other people but instead of like trying to attack anybody he's just like hey come to this room we'll protect you and he's in this room he's like but we're all fucking first man this is the fun fuck zombie like his whole vibe he did not care what movie he did not care yeah. what anybody else was doing he's just like this is how i host here's my conversation pit throw your keys yeah. right there and we'll see what happens we're all slugs here right yeah 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 you're right. That's the thing is that even in slug parasite culture, you got your smooth guys and you got your not so smooth guys. And I bought guys. it. And, I would be like, you know, yeah. I've been running for an hour, but I'm in. So. Yeah. Honestly, at this point, you seem like <laughs> the nicest slug. And that is kind of the vibe in terms of dating as a woman. Wait, can, um, okay, earlier, man. <laughs> yeah. Earlier, Kate, did you call this movie Bachelors in Parasite? <laughs> I didn't, but um, Don't you wish you wrote did? all of my other jokes in the introduction. So might as well take that one, too. Thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm going to have to Man. throw um, thrown out to my girl, Lynn Lowry, uh, because she played the nurse. Yes. Uh, just, you know what? Mm-hmm. She There wasn't a great character written for her there, but I do have a soft spot for her. She was in like, she was, you know, in, in a lot of B movies at the time. Uh, but I think she was the only one that reacted genuinely to like attempting to get raped and like all of that, because all the mm-hmm. other actresses and actors in the movie were like, no, I'm going to put up a fight. Okay, give me the parasite. And she, you know, she yeah. pulled out some real screens. She was a frantic. She was kind of all over the place. But I think that worked. And I was yeah. so fucking confused by Nicholas's wife. What was going oh, on? Oh, I hated her. Right? I, I like, didn't know what she I hated couldn't her decide. from the beginning. And I didn't know what she was. I mean, God forbid I sound like a man. But, like, I don't know what you're saying you want. <laughs> no, she couldn't decide. I feel like the actress herself couldn't, couldn't decide. decide what she wanted to do with the character. That was She was messy. Yeah. She was all over the place. Yes. She was a sloppy bitch. Yeah. And it conveyed. Oh yeah, the, uh, the oh, yeah. nurse. The nurse is so good too. In the in the scene where she finds the like the mechanic guy in the garage, she comes oh, down yeah. in the basement. She stops, and I expected her to scream, and she doesn't. She gets this horrified look on her face and backs out of the scene so perfectly that it was really <laughs> believable. I, I I made a note in my phone about it. It was like that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. She good. seemed yeah. to be the only one realizing that this stuff isn't like you know just out of the ordinary this is you know all fucking strange uh so <laughs> she was you could tell a veteran b movie actress yes. for sure she knew how to deliver on what was being asked of her and she was excellent at it i think she had the biggest crowd moment too when she just wouldn't fucking use the fork just stab him with the fork and then she finally stabs the guy with the fork <laughs> and we all just screamed over here it's like yeah fork him <laughs> yeah, that fight, yeah, fork, was fork, drawn fork. out. <laughs> so I think, from what I have absorbed from everyone's awards, I'm going to go ahead and give the the Mr. King crown, the Mr. Manager crown, to one Miss Van. That's you. I think yeah, you you came out the gate with a stronger and clearer vision of your opinion than any of the other assholes, and you seem cool. I would like to thank the new. Academy, Ryan, for this opportunity. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, this is so fun. I, I, I love sure these won. movies. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I I I and it conveyed a new rule. So everyone else is losers, and that's the way it goes. And I'm so sorry to the to the three who are left in the dust. Van that's and I are walking to the sunset. Okay, I do. I don't know if it's too late, but it, I actually read my notes wrong. Pound for pound performance, it actually says is Kate as host. That's actually who I voted. Yes, for. really. Yeah. I think I did a really good job. I second it. So, no, I do. I think I did a good job. I think I was like, well, because I I treated it like I was a hostess uh-huh. at a party, and I was like, okay, pay attention. Who needs to Who needs to be included in this moment? Based on me saying that, though, it. do you want to change who won the show? Yeah, Ryan gets it. That's how compliments Don't work. Don't cave in <laughs> to terrorism, Kate. <laughs> and when we're back, final words. And so, Cronenberg's 1975 Shivers. How do we think it stacks up against the other movies in this mini bracket? Uh, let's start with you, Ryan. I did like it, and I... I specifically like the 1975 of it all. You know, if this was my first 1975 movie, I think it would be weird. But comparing it to what we have watched and what we're going to watch, I don't know. I think I love doing these movies that aren't four stars, don't have a chance of winning the whole thing. But it definitely puts us in a place in time. This is Mm -hmm. this is what 1975 was like. And I think that's super fun to see. Excellent. What about you, Mike? Uh, As often... My opinion is more positive at the end of this conversation than the beginning, which yeah. makes me a weak-willed little shit. That means yeah, we won. a little bit. You, you all win. We just I, slugged I, you. I that's all. You made You're me You're one think. of us. But one I of still us. think he's a sloppy <laughs> bitch and didn't really know what he was trying to say yet. I, yeah. I think he. this is obviously an earlier thing uh, yeah. in his thing. Uh, words. And no, I, I don't think this is. You're gonna doing do such well. a good job, Mike, Thank in terms you. of just like saying a word after the other word and it like becoming a sentence. I do Congrats. think in in the there's going to be a series of bonus shows uh, throughout '75 as we learn the context of 1975 for the real bracket. And I do think this could take on a few of the others that are coming up. I, I think this yeah. could take on Rollerball. I think this could take on uh, 
Picnic at Hanging Rock, nobody I know has enjoyed that movie and said anything great and that we're all fools for not having it in the real bracket, so this probably could destroy Picnic at Hanging Rock. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th- th- there's potential here. You can see the young yeah. Grunberg's potential. Yeah. And Nate and Van, you're like me. We don't have actually like a lot of investment in terms of their narrative arc for the season. So what do you feel about this movie as 1975? For example, I watched Jaws a couple weeks ago for the first time in a long time. That's a 1975 movie. And comparing those two films really was a shocking thing in terms of the types of performance, the types of budgets that were given. Um, What do you guys, if you were to make an educated guess, how do you feel about how this movie stood in comparison to its contemporaries? I'm just going to say I've seen a lot of bad 1970s movies. So I'm going to say it's not the worst, but it's definitely not the best. <laughs> I, yes. I mean, Van, how many of those that you've seen could we do an hour on? You know, oh, like... there are some. <laughs> if you want to watch bad, bad movies, there are a lot from the 70s. Uh, but I don't think <laughs> most of them are appropriate to talk about. But uh, yeah, so, you know, not not like good. I like this the movie, 70s porn. PG. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of those, um, there's, a, yeah, a lot of those often will go off the rating chart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about you, Nate? I think the big thing is based on my understanding of of the the films that will be in the bracket mm-hmm. that most of those are actually going to have some sort of social commentary that is fully formed and compelling, um, whether it's about the nature of capitalism, the nature of manhood, the nature of something. Right? Um, mm-hmm. How is America falling apart? How is America coming back together? This movie doesn't really do any of those things. I mean, it does have the loose sort of conceit of like, well, are we? Are we, you know, man versus nature, nature versus man, man versus God. Like it does those basic sorts of things in, mm. in, in measures. So uh, this is not, this would not hold up against probably any of the other movies. Uh, but it's, it was a lot better than I expected it to be. I went into mm-hmm. this with very low, you know, low, uh, <laughs> low expectations and, and no stakes. And I, and I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, this is, this is a pulpy seventies horror movie mm-hmm. and I'll take it. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I do like that Nate only shows up for our slug-based movies. It's true. Oh, it's weird. Co- color out of space in this. You have a thing, buddy. Our purple slugs. Have we ever seen... I'm, I mean, I've never seen the bottom half of Nate. I mean, he very well might be a giant slug. Yeah. In fact, I had to guess three of you are <laughs> slugs involved. Uh, that's just a slug to penis reference. Um, oh. In the meantime, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I realized I haven't seen any of you below the waist, and almost certainly slugs are involved in all. Um, just so if you didn't hear the joke the first time, you got it the second time. Did you say the um, joke? The joke. Uh, yes, a joke. <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm just <laughs> so wondering if you're until... coining a term. I like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I always am, baby. That's the truth of being an icon. So, <laughs> Nate. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? Oh, I yes. I would love uh, if anybody who likes this podcast and wants to listen to a goofy little uh, comedy trivia podcast, they could check out my show, A Vague Idea. All uh, three uh, of the other folks on the show, other than Van, Van, you can come on the show if you're interested. Oh, I'd love to. But, uh, but Ryan, Mike, and Kate have all been on the show as wonderful guests, and it's always a, a fun time. So I would mm-hmm. love for people to check that out. Nate, I heard your a episode about idea. dinosaurs, and it was fucking amazing. See, thank you. <laughs> this, I'm so glad that you had those two guests and nobody else. <laughs> We're all great. We're all happy about it. <laughs> Van, anything you'd like? To sure, talk? I do portrait photography. Follow me on Instagram s.v.mb. Um, I just made a home studio, so there will be a lot more to upload soon. And end of the month, I'm coming out with a podcast, The Social Anxiety Network, where we talk about networking in Hollywood with anxiety. So, yeah, check those two out when uh, that rules. You want. Damn, Van's so much cooler than everyone else here. That's intimidating, <laughs> huh, guys? <laughs> I've never been cool, uh, so I don't really. I'm not yeah, really you've you've it. you've grown used to this feeling, this sensation. <laughs> um, YPF boys, I know you have plugs that you're going to put in at the end, but you want to say anything about your things? Or? I just, I just want to plug uh, good friends and Mike. Yeah, I want to. I just you're my good friend. Thank you. Someday. Maybe I'll feel the same about you. <laughs> and for those who are interested in more of this, uh, I currently have a podcast named Movies I'd Like to Fix, MILF, 
with my dear friend Daniel Tompkins. You can find us on all major podcast apps. We're very funny. We're very good. <laughs> Typically, our stan is Greg. He's not here, but I trust that the YPF official stance is my podcast rules. So... Until then, <laughs> it rules. Uh, Sorry, I, I, didn't, you, you were, I didn't realize you were really searching there. I was trying to be a polite guest. Yeah, it rules. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that feels authentic and it feels good. Till then, my typically I'd say keep Milfin, but what does YPF sign off with? Like keep watching them movies or keep uh, watching them movies. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>